introductory uh, work on the matter of thinking. The first hour, the hour we're in, I'm going to uh, talk about what is thinking, uh, give you some uh, working definitions of the term thinking, uh, and we'll talk about uh, who thinks, uh, how they think, and uh, who doesn't think. During the second hour, we'll talk about uh, the attack on thinking. Uh, and the attack on thinking, of course, is uh, led by some <clears throat> uh, some notable thinkers. And uh, it it's, sounds paradoxical, but uh, there are many intellectuals that uh, despise the intellect. And uh, we'll be talking about that attack on thinking in the second hour. The third hour, we'll talk about the scripture mandate for thinking. And that'll be at 8 o'clock this evening. Uh, why should we think? Do we have a command to think in Scripture? And so forth. Tomorrow evening we'll talk about the source of thinking. We'll talk about the doctrine of God to begin. And then the doctrine of the creation of man. The doctrine of man as the image of God. And finally the virtue of rationality in the third hour. Uh, thinking God's thoughts after him. Uh, on Wednesday evening the purpose of thinking. Uh, uh, we'll cover only three aspects of it. There are many purposes of thinking, but uh, these are the three major ones, the knowledge of God, knowledge of ourselves, and the glory of God. And we'll be talking about those uh, Wednesday evening. Thursday evening, we'll be talking about the content of thinking, uh, propositional revelation. We'll be spending a little bit of time discussing education and what education is. We'll be talking about priorities. We'll be looking at examples in Scripture of people who have uh, incorrect priorities and people who have correct priorities and uh, see what the distinction is between those uh, groups of people and how we set our own priorities. And in the third hour, we'll talk about thinking about non-Christian ideas. What's the role of thinking about non-Christian ideas? Obviously, we do think about them. So what is the purpose of that thinking? And Friday, the method of thinking, we'll be spending uh, three hours on logic. This will be somewhat different from the course in logic that I gave here uh, a few years ago. Uh, it'll be in some ways more basic. We won't get so much into the uh, technical aspect of logic, uh, but talk about some very basic things. What's the role of words? Uh, how do we fit words into sentences? the meaning of sentences in propositions, uh, the making of judgments, the construction of arguments, and that sort of thing. And finally, on uh, Saturday morning, uh, the schedule is that we'll be talking about the enemies of thinking biblically, the world, the flesh, and the devil. That is, the influence of human thought and culture, the inf influence of human philosophy, uh, the influence of our own imaginations and our own arrogance uh, coming under the category of the flesh and finally the influence of the devils. Uh, and we'll be talking about witchcraft, so be sure to uh, come for Saturday morning if you miss the rest of the week. Um, we, we, might, we might end up burning some witches. I don't know. Um, but that's the outline of the course. And this evening, the topic is, is simply, uh, what is thinking for the first hour? Now, I hope you have all brought your Bibles. We'll be using the Bible extensively. Uh, we'll be going over hundreds of verses uh, this week, uh, looking at what the scriptures have to say about thinking. So make sure you bring your Bibles each hour uh, to class. Uh, I'm using, and I'll be using, a New King James Version. If you want to uh, follow along in a different version, that's fine. Uh, but I'll be reading from uh, largely either the King James or the New King James. Um, if you take notes, and I hope you do, uh, I don't see how you're going to remember the hundreds of passages we're going to discuss uh, without taking notes this evening um, and for the rest of the week. So I hope you brought a notebook in order to uh, remember some of what um, we're talking about. Well, I'll begin this evening um, <clears throat> with a, a quote from Bertrand Russell, uh, who was, uh, of course, no Christian, uh, 
But he's a very clever man nonetheless. And um, he wrote at one point, many people would sooner die than think. In fact, they do. Very clever man. Many people would sooner die than think. In fact, they do. And that's the case. Many people spend their entire lives avoiding thought. Uh, when we talk about the influence of the world, we'll talk about the distractions of the world. Uh, we'll talk about amusing ourselves to death um, in entertainment and movies and so forth. Whatever, just to avoid thought, just to avoid a serious thought their whole lives. Well, how does the dictionary define thinking? Well, if we look at uh, Merriam-Webster's uh, seventh edition, which is the last edition I recommend, um, the verb to think is defined this way. The first meaning is to form or have in mind. The second meaning given by Merriam-Webster is intend or plan. The third meaning is to have an opinion or to regard as. The fourth meaning is to reflect on, to ponder. On down to meaning number nine, which they give as to subject to the processes of logical thought. To subject to the processes of logical thought. And then the intransitive verb, they define as to exercise the powers of judgment, conception, or inference, that is reason, to have the mind engaged in reflection, to meditate. And it's that form of the verb to think that we are mostly concerned with. To exercise the powers of judgment, conception, or inference, that is reason to have the mind engaged in reflection uh, or to meditate. Now the Bible uses the word think many times. I have uh, an overhead here. I'll put up on the screen. <clears throat> And uh, in the King James Version, the English word think occurs uh, 82 times uh, in Scripture. But there are many related words in Scripture, many words that are of uh, similar meaning in Scripture. Uh, understand, for example, occurs 266 times in the King James Version, the English Bible. The word know occurs over 1,400 times uh, in the English version of the King James Version of Scripture. There are other words as well used fewer times. There's the verb consider, used 98 times. Uh, the verbs uh, reckon or judge or meditate. And we'll be talking about meditation in a little bit distinguishing what uh, biblical meditation is from what uh, Eastern meditation is. And all of these words are used in, the, in a general sense of uh, meaning to make judgments, to reason, to subject to the logical processes of thought. <clears throat> now thinking, we should uh, uh, understand uh, if we go by this definition as a working definition, uh, is not equivalent to being conscious. Thinking is not the same thing as being conscious. It's not mere awareness. It is not merely being aware. Your dog is conscious. Your dog is not a machine as the French philosopher Descartes thought he was. And your dog is conscious. The Bible, in fact, describes animals as having souls. The animals have souls, according to Scripture. They are conscious. They are aware. They have what uh, philosophers call sentience. not think. Animals do not think. They are conscious, they are aware, but they do not think. 
Your dog doesn't plan what he's going to do tomorrow. Your dog cannot add two and two. Your dog can't come up with a theorem in geometry. Your dog doesn't think. Now, in recent years, uh, we've heard a great deal about uh, people who allege that that's not the case. They say that animals do too think. And they stomp their foot when they say it, much like Clever Hans did. Does anybody ever recall reading about Clever Hans? Well, at the turn of the century, the first decade of the 20th century, uh, there was a German fellow who owned a horse. And uh, the horse could do arithmetic. He could add and subtract. He could multiply and divide. Uh, he could even answer questions about music. And uh, he learned all these things because his master had developed a table in which he gave a numeric equivalent of every letter in the alphabet. So he just didn't do mathematical calculations. He actually spelled out words by stomping his feet. And he earned the nickname of Clever Hans. Um, and it created quite a sensation at, in the early part of uh, this century. This, this extremely intelligent horse, obviously he didn't have the physical equipment in his throat to speak, but he could stomp his foot and answer questions. Well, today we have, I don't know of any clever Hanses, that is, horses around, but today it's mostly uh, dolphins or gorillas or apes, uh, that sort of thing, which are alleged to understand, uh, to think, to reason, uh, and to give correct answers. And uh, it's a very common theory among some zoologists uh, that these animals can do this. But animals do not think. Uh, if you look at a couple of verses of scripture, <clears throat> and we'll talk more about this later when we talk about the doctrine of man, um, read, they're very short books, read uh, Jude, for example, this evening or tomorrow morning when you have a chance, and there you will find a description of animals. And uh, in the English versions, it's usually translated as brute animals. Brute animals. The Greek behind that English word brute means without speech or without reason. That's what the Greek is behind that word brute. Without speech or without logic. Elogia without speech or without reason. And there are many other verses in Scripture that teach the same thing, but uh, read, uh, read Jude and you'll see that. Um, but returning to human beings, uh, thinking is not daydreaming. Perhaps some of you are daydreaming already. Um, that's an uh, occupational hazard of being a teacher, is to have your, your listeners daydream. And when you're daydreaming, you're not thinking. You may be uh, uh, imagining things. You may be remembering things. You may be wishing things. But you're not planning. You're not calculating. You're not subjecting your thoughts to logical processes. You're not thinking. You're just aware. And you have an active imagination. And you're dreaming. You're daydreaming in this case. Uh, not thinking. Uh, thinking involves understanding. It involves understanding. There's a, uh, if I'm blocking your way here, just make hand motions or something and I'll get out of the way. Um, you've probably seen the, uh, what is it, the far side cartoon of what your dog hears when you're talking to him. Blah, 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 Fido, blah, 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 blah. That's what the dog hears. Well, the dog doesn't even hear that much. Uh, the dog hears a noise that he recognizes. And that noise may happen to be Rover or Fido or something. But he doesn't understand. He doesn't have a concept of himself to begin with. He doesn't have a concept of the idea of name. 
that things have names. He doesn't rise to the level of understanding. He hears a noise that he's heard before, and he knows that if he does certain things when he hears that noise, like wag his tail or come running or whatever it might be, uh, he's going to be patted on the head or given a treat or something of that sort. So the dog hears a noise in the middle of blah, 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 and he responds to that noise by wagging his tail. And that's it. He doesn't have understanding. The scripture says in many verses, the animals do not understand. And that's a clue to what the doctrine of uh, the image of God is. Certainly they don't analyze. Thinking involves analysis. It's not simply understanding the words. You're, I'm speaking English right now. You're understanding the words. Um, you're analyzing what I'm thinking. You're, you're, what I'm saying, you're analyzing my words and saying, well, that's not right because such and such. Uh, you're trying to come up with answers why or reasons why. And notice the word reason keeps cropping up. Uh, reasons why what I'm saying is right or what I'm saying is wrong. You're analyzing these things. You're making connections. You're drawing inferences. You're making connections between one idea and another idea. And if you do this for any length of time, you're engaging in thinking. Most basically of all, thinking involves words. Words tag thoughts. Words tag thoughts. We use words to refer to ideas. We have an idea of a domestic animal with a long tail at one end and a meow at the other end. And we use the word cat to tag that thought. If we have a different idea uh, of an object in the front yard with a that's vertical, it's brown on the bottom and green on the top, we use the word tree to tag that thought. And thinking involves words. It's impossible for us to think without words. Words are expressions of thought. Words are expressions of thought. Animals don't know words. They don't understand. They don't analyze. They don't draw inferences. They don't subject what they hear to logical analysis because they are without logic, as the scripture says. They are without reason. If you read the Westminster Confession, the, uh, the uh, larger catechism, you will see that it refers to animals having souls, it is echoing scripture in that regard. But they do not have rational souls in the language of the catechism. Animals do not have rational souls. Men do. Animals do not. Man is not an animal. Quite a difference between them. Well, we've already talked about uh, some of the related words in the Bible. <clears throat> and uh, those are some numbers there I'll give you. I'll ask the question at this point, who thinks? Who thinks? Uh, persons think. Persons think. In fact, this is what makes a person. It is thinking that makes a person. Persons think. Uh, God thinks. Let's look at a few verses here. Let's look at... Um, if I can find my uh, correct list here. Look at Jeremiah 29.11, if you would turn there, please. Jeremiah 29.11. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a hope and a future. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you. 
God not only thinks, he knows what he thinks. I know the thoughts that I think toward you. Uh, man thinks. There are many verses that we might uh, uh, use for this. If you turn to Proverbs uh, 24. I'm sorry, Proverbs 23. Starting at verse 6, Proverbs 23. Do not eat the bread of a miser, nor desire his delicacies. For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. And you'll notice, and we'll get into this more later, that it is the heart that thinks. It is the heart that thinks. We have some commands in the New Testament. Turn, if you would, to uh, Matthew 3, chapter 9. We have a command uh, of John the Baptist <clears throat> to the Pharisees and the Sadducees not to think, not to think a certain thought. He says in verse 9, Do not think to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. Do not think to say for yourself. To say to yourself. Uh, turn to Matthew 9, if you would please. Uh, looking at verse 1. So he got into a boat, crossed over, and came to his own city. Then behold, they brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, be of good cheer, your sins are forgiven you. And at once some of the scribes said within themselves, This man blasphemes. See, they had made a judgment. Christ had said something, Son, be of good cheer, your sins are forgiven you. And they concluded this man blasphemes. Now you can construct the argument, the unstated argument that they used to arrive at this conclusion. It involves the premise that Jesus Christ is only a man. He's a mere man. It involves a premise denying his deity. Because only God can forgive sin. This man is a mere man, therefore this man blasphemes. And notice Jesus' response. But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why do you think evil in your hearts? Jesus knows their thoughts. He knows their conclusion. He knows the argument by which they arrived at that conclusion. And I should say at this point, the argument is logically valid. The conclusion is false because one of the premises is false. The premise is, this is a mere man, not God. Only God can forgive sins, so this man blasphemes. Uh, it's a good argument, it's a valid argument. False conclusion because there's a false premise. And we'll get into this more when we talk about logic. But notice what Jesus, they're talking to themselves. Thinking is frequently described in scripture as saying to themselves. They said within themselves, this man blasphemes and Jesus, knowing their thoughts. He's the second person of the Trinity. He's omniscient. He knows all things, including their and your thoughts. He says, why do you think evil in your hearts? Why do you think evil in your hearts? Among other things we ought to learn there is not simply that it's the heart that thinks, but it's possible to think evil thoughts. Uh, there are many philosophers today, and many people who are not philosophers, that deny that it's possible to have an evil thought. Evil can only be some outward action in their minds. Not true. It's very clear from Scripture that there is such a thing as evil thoughts. And Christ here refers to them. Why do you think evil thoughts? Well, let's go on and look at some other verses. Um, in Matthew uh, 17 if you'll turn to Matthew 17 and beginning at uh, 24 verse 24 when they had come to Capernaum those who received the temple tax came to Peter and said does your teacher not pay the temple tax 
He said yes. And when he had come into the house, Jesus anticipated him, saying, What do you think, Simon? From whom do the kings of the earth take customs or taxes from their sons or from strangers? He's asking a question that requires Simon to think. What do you think? Who is required to pay taxes? The sons or strangers? And Simon has to give it some thought and answers. Um, many other questions like that in Scripture. I won't give you all the citations. Um, John 5, let's turn to a slightly different one. John 5, verse 39. Christ is reprimanding the Pharisees again. He says, You search the Scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. And these are they which testify of me. But you are not willing to come to me that you may have life. There again, he's, in this case, it's they, they're holding the opinion that they think they have eternal life from the scriptures. But they don't understand the scriptures. It says, you search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. In other um, portions of scripture, he asks the disciples, who do you think I am? Uh, many questions in that nature. Uh, many verses that teach that man is a thinking being in contrast uh, to animals. We read one or two verses that talk about God thinking. Uh, let me see if I can give you a couple other references on this. Uh, we read Jeremiah 29.11. Um, let's read some verses that use other verbs instead of uh, can, uh, think uh, 2 Samuel 18 we'll go back to the Old Testament 2 Samuel 18 verse 27 let's read the um, the, start with verse 26 then the watchman saw another man running and the watchman called to the gatekeeper and said there is another man running alone and the king said he also brings news so the watchman said I think the running of the first is like the running of Ahamaz the son of Zadok and the king said he is a good man and comes with good news uh, here you have the watchman expressing an opinion he knows what Ahamaz runs like he sees this figure running in the distance. He sees the same gate or a similar gate. And he reaches the conclusion that this is a Hamas running. And the king reaches the conclusion uh, that the good news is coming. Well, let me give you some citations quickly here that you can read uh, at your leisure. God thinks. We read Jeremiah 29.11. Read Nehemiah 6.14. Nehemiah 5.19, Psalm 40.17, uh, other verbs that uh, are used synonymously with think, uh, Matthew 9.4, Matthew 6.7, Acts 17.29, uh, the verb reason itself, Luke 10.36, John 5.39, Luke 8.5. The word meditate in scripture is used uh, at several points in the sense of think. Um, <clears throat> let me see if I can find my list of the verb meditate. Uh, Psalm 1. Turn to Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. Here's a contrast between the godly man and the ungodly man. The counsel of the ungodly, the philosophy, the advice, the ideas of the ungodly, he doesn't walk according to those. He doesn't stand in the path of sinners. He doesn't sit in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law, the revelation of the Lord. 
The law refers to the entire scriptures. It's not simply the Ten Commandments or the case law of Old Testament Israel. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He studies it. Meditation in scripture is not Eastern meditation. I have a, uh, a book here that was very popular in the 1970s, How to Meditate, by Lawrence Lashan. He was a psychotherapist in New York City. I don't know if he's still alive or not. A million copies uh, sold in the 1970s. Uh, the subtitle is A Guide to Self-Discovery. And uh, what he suggests for meditation, of course, doesn't have anything to do with the meditation described in Scripture. Uh, I'll give you some idea of what he talks about. He says primarily that meditation is an emptying of the mind. An emptying of the mind. One of the exercises that he recommends for meditation is counting your breaths as you breathe. You count. And if you get really good at it, you don't think about your counting. That's the goal, not even to think about the counting. But sit there, close your eyes, get comfortable, empty your mind of everything except an awareness of your breathing, and then count each breath you take. And pretty soon, if you work at it for years, you can get to the point uh, where you don't even think about counting. Now that's the complete opposite of what Scripture says, as we read from Psalm 1, where Scripture says, His delight is in the law of the Lord, and he meditates in the law day and night. The goal in biblical meditation, biblical thinking, is not to empty your mind, but to fill your mind with the revealed propositions. That's the goal. Not to empty your mind, not to seek, as he, as Dr. Lashawn recommends, seek for the spirit that is beyond the spirit. It's very mystical. But to pick up the scriptures, read them, and think about what you're reading. That's biblical meditation, biblical thinking. And the godly man does that. <coughs> There are many other things involved in Eastern meditation. There's, of course, the pantheism, and Lashan stresses that as well. We, we learn we're one with the universe, and we cannot fall out of the universe. That's his language. We cannot fall out of the universe. We're, we're one with the universe. There's, uh, in the past, some mystics have used asceticism in, in the Middle Ages, uh, uh, Roman Catholic mystics. Uh, we're very much into asceticism. Um, contradictions. To show how thoroughly uh, anti-thinking uh, Eastern meditation is, he says, if we have learned one thing from modern physics, it is that there may be two viewpoints about something which are mutually contradictory, and yet both viewpoints are equally correct. Now, in a sense, he doesn't mean it in this sense, but in a sense, they're equally correct in that they're both wrong. But, uh, <clears throat> but he means they're equally correct. And when you arrive at the point where you can affirm contradictions, then you're making it up the scale uh, toward your goal of um, denying your mind, denying your reason. He also defends, at one point, of course, drug use. He said drugs can uh, give you this um, insight that you're seeking through uh, meditation much more quickly, but the only danger is you won't be prepared uh, as you would as if you meditated and it took years for you to do it. But if, but if you really want the insight rapidly, sort of a, an instant insight, you know, take your LSD or whatever. Uh, that will give you that spiritual insight as well. The, uh, I'll give you a quote here from uh, Carl Jung, 
uh, one of the most famous uh, psychologists of the 20th century, um, probably second only to Freud. Um, Jung talked about the mentality of the East, and, and this is what he said about Hindus in particular. He said, the Hindus are notoriously weak in rational exposition. They think for the most part in parables and images. And we'll talk about images later on. But they think for the most part in parables and images. Now, why did Christ uh, teach in parables? Does anyone know? Yes, sir. I saw a hand. To make people think? Anybody have a different idea? Yes, sir. He did it to obscure. He did it to obscure. He explains that very well. Um, his disciples ask him, why are you teaching in parables? And he says, because it is given to you to know, but it is not given to them to know. He teaches in parables to confuse people. He teaches in figures of speech to confuse people. But through the disciples, he speaks plainly in Scripture. And he takes them aside and explains in plain language what the parables mean. But he gives the parables to confuse people. Well, continuing with Jung here, he says, the, uh, the Hindus think for the most part in parables or images. They are not interested in reason. That, of course, is a basic condition of the Orient as a whole. And continuing with Jung, so far as I can see, an Indian, so long as he remains an Indian, doesn't think. Now, Indians are very intelligent. It's not a matter of intelligence. It's a matter here of subjecting thought to logical processes, to analysis. Rather, he, per he perceives a thought, is the way Jung puts it. He perceives a thought. In this way, the Indian approximate primitive ways of thinking. Now, no one's denying that Orientals are human beings. They are. They're made in the image of God. And despite their best efforts, they still think the laws of logic. But if you ask them, they'll deny those laws. And in their denial, they have to use those laws. Well, um, God, angels, and human individuals think. We've covered a few of those. I haven't said anything about angels. Maybe we'll get to those later. Uh, but animals do not think. Plants do not think. It, back in the crazy 70s and 60s again, um, you were told that if you talked to your plants, the plants would grow better. Uh, <clears throat> because the plants can understand what you're saying. Or if you played music for your plants, they, they love Mozart. Or, uh, I don't know, maybe they loved uh, Metallica. But anyway, you played music for your plants, and the plants would grow better. Um, rocks. Uh, well, we had pet rocks, didn't we, back in the 70s? Uh, I don't know if anybody actually thought they, uh, they thought, um, but they certainly thought that uh, plants think but there's another, uh, at the other end of the spectrum, as it were, groups don't think either. Uh, only persons think, and a group is not a person. Only persons think. Uh, the psychologist, the, the sociologist, some political scientists will talk about the group mind. The group mind. Well, groups don't think. Persons think, individuals think. And the same for nation or churches. Nations or churches, they don't think. And in my um, lectures on economics, I said, among other things, this is very helpful if you keep this in mind when you're dealing with a bureaucracy. Uh, you go to the bureaucracy and, and uh, say, well, that's, that's the policy. We can't change the policy. Well, somewhere, someone, some person made that policy. So what you have to do if you want any satisfaction from a bureaucracy, which loves to hide behind the group, is find the person who made the policy and get him to change it. Now, that, that can work with governments. 
Uh, it can work if you have a dispute with the local store. You talk to the sales clerk, and the sales clerk say, well, this is store policy. Well, ask to speak to the manager. The manager says, well, this is store policy, and I don't make it. Ask to speak to the person who makes the policy. Groups do not think. Groups do not make policies. When you have a, uh, a conglomeration such as the U.S. Congress, uh, look at the voting records. Find out the persons who made the decision to raise your taxes. Those were made by individual persons, those decisions. So at one end of the spectrum, the plants and the rocks and the animals don't think. At the other end, the groups and nations and churches don't think. Um, <clears throat> so far as I know, Scripture says the church has one head. That is Christ.